Hello and welcome to the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm your host, Ian Harditz, and today we continue our team preview series with a look at the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, if you haven't checked out the rest of our episodes already, I invite you to, you know, scroll through Spotify, iTunes, whatever. I've been trying to make these as evergreen as possible. We will be completing all 32 teams before week one. So without further ado, your 2020 Las Vegas Raiders fantasy football team preview. Starts with Derek Carr. And look, I have been critical of Derek Carr in the past. He has blocked me on Twitter accordingly, and I deserve that. You know, there's only so many times you can make fun of a guy for not really handling pressure well or constantly checking down and expect to get away with it. So, you know, obviously that dude, bunch of arm talent. He's actually, his last seat, like what he did in 2019 was in my mind, the best version of Derek Carr we've seen. I know he was in the MVP race in 2016, but I think that was more due to, you know, a lot of success in one score games, kind of had some big moments. We hadn't seen a more efficient version of Derek Carr than we did last year, but I mean, in fantasy land, here's the problem. Like, again, this was the best version of Carr we've seen in almost any metric last year. And it was good for the be fantasies QB 15. This just hasn't been a guy, even though he's had one of the league's best offensive lines continuously, he's always had weapons there, you know, Amari Cooper and Michael Crabtree back in the day. Now, you know, Darren Waller, or Renfro, Williams, like, okay, they're not, it's not the Kansas City Chiefs or Dallas Cowboys we're talking about in terms of uh, weaponry, but, you know, plenty of guys to put forth some solid fantasy production, and we just haven't seen it. There's never been a rushing floor, and, you know, I do think it's a conversation to wonder how many games he starts this year. If you look at Mariota, two-year, $17.6 million contract. We know Mayock loves the guy, and just from a career perspective, they're almost identical in terms of some of their stats. I mean, Carr, you know, a 64% completion rate. Mariota, 63%. They're both at a 4.3% touchdown rate. I mean, Carr's been a, li- Carr's been a little less prone to interceptions, but he's also been uh, less efficient in terms of yards per attempt. At the end of the day, their quarterback rating is less than a point apart. I mean, I'm not saying Mariota is this big time upgrade over Carr. I don't envision a situation where, you know, like we saw in Tennessee last year, where Mariota enters this offense and just starts balling out. But, you know, it's, I, I wouldn't expect it to happen anytime in, you know, September or even October. But if we see the uh, Raiders, you know, struggling, four and 10, something like that, wouldn't be shocking to see Mariota come in at the end of the season. So there's a scenario where, you know, we got this, we got all this new talent in with the wide receiver position. Maybe that's what Carr really needs to make that Tannehill-esque seventh season leap. But I just feel like at this point, We've seen it. The guy needs everything to pretty much be perfect around him in order to be an above average quarterback. When it's not, he really struggles. So, you know, I am selling the idea of Carr's, uh, you know, best season still being to come. Now at running back, we have one of, in my mind, the top five players in the league with the ball in their hands in Josh Jacobs. And, you know, he doesn't catch the passes. We know that. We've been through this. Last year, somehow, Jalen Richard and DeAndre Washington had more targets than Jacobs. I mean, he just could not get the ball. I mean, it was, it was absurd. And it's just unfortunate because when they drafted him, Mike Mayock, their GM said, this is a three down back. He's explosive. He's tough. You know, we've watched him pass protect. So, okay. He had a broken shoulder last year. Maybe that was why they limited him because he was playing through his pain. You know, why, why force your running back who's trying to play through the pain and has a broken shoulder to, you know, stand there in the A-gap and take on a blitzing linebacker. But just every single front office move they made in the offseason reinforces the idea that he's going to be a primary early down back. I mean, they re-signed Jalen Richard. They signed Devontae Booker, who's been, you know, the Broncos' uh, primary receiving back over the last few years. They used a third-round pick on this, you know, wide receiver, running back, wildcat, QB, hybrid, and Lynn Bowden. And, you know, that's not even to mention, now sounding theoretic over the last few weeks. So this would be a complete mess if Jacobs goes down because they don't even really have anyone on this roster. That's a true three down back behind Jacobs, but clearly they aren't really treating him like that. And again, it's unfortunate because this dude last year, number two among 61 qualified RBs in elusive rating. I mean, only Nick Chubb broke more total tackles than Josh Jacobs last year. And he didn't missing three games. I mean, he was number three among running backs and 15 plus yard runs too. I mean, put on the Josh Jacobs highlights and you're going to go from six to midnight in a hurry, everyone. So it's a situation where I wish he was getting the extra targets, but at some point, I think we almost, uh, you know, with guys like Nick Chubb and uh, Mixon to an extent and Jacobs, like they're not getting 
the targets, which is unfortunate. But, you know, as we saw with Derrick Henry last year, if you're running, if you're a talented running back that can get 300 plus carries in an above average offense, you can flirt with top five uh, production at the running back position. So, you know, while I, I'm not going to have Jacobs ranked in the top five or six, like he's definitely still in the tier of running backs that I'm prioritizing and want on the fantasy football squad. Moving on to wide receiver. So I was thinking this three wide receiver set would be Henry Ruggs, Tyrell Williams, and Hunter Rempro in the slot. You know, that's not a not, not, not a slight at all to Brian Edwards stands out there. I get it. You know, only reason he fell in the third round was because of some injury concerns, which have since been cleared up. But it's more a testament to how good uh, Williams and to a little bit lesser extent Rempro have been. I mean, Williams is the only player in the league to average at least 10 yards per target in each of the past three seasons. I mean, he, well, he scored a touchdown, I believe, in each of his first six games last year. And he's, he's been efficient. He's been great. But now he's going to be trying to play through a torn labrum. And so it makes a lot of sense that Brian Edwards could, you know, take his spot on the depth chart sooner rather than later in Renfro. Good for him, guys. He finished, I believe, 11th or 12th in yards per route run last season. And the group of guys, I mean, here are the only wide receivers to average more yards per route run than Renfro in 2019. Michael Thomas, Stephon Diggs, A.J. Brown, Tyree Kill, Julio Jones, Devontae Adams, Mike Evans, Amari Cooper, Chris Goblin, and Michael Gallup. Then we have little Renfro. And, you know, is was some of that a little fluky based on, you know, a slant he might have popped after two dudes ran into each other? Yeah, but clearly he's an NFL talent. You know, he did enough in that uh, in that offense to continue to warrant plenty of reps. I don't think he's going to lead the team in receiving or anything like that. But it was just a guy that, you know, could feasibly limit Edwards' involvement from day one. I, I just – I haven't had the same thought process of worrying about Henry Ruggs. I mean, you don't draft – someone at number 12 overall and then not feature him as your number one option in the pass game. And, you know, I feel like the one kind of uh, miss, just the mistake we were making when evaluating rugs has been assuming that this guy that runs a four, two, seven forty is only a field stretcher. And, you know, considering Derek Carr has never, you know, ranked in the top half of the league and, you know, his deep ball rate just passes thrown 20 plus yards downfield. If you were using that assumption about rugs, you know, you're not going to come into a very uh, favorable year one takeaway, but you put on his Alabama film and you see why this was the highest rated uh, receiver in college football last year in terms of QB rating when targeting the guy. And, you know, it slants, screens, crossers, the dude makes plays. He's electric with the ball in his hands. And I think we're going to start to see the days of John Gruden's target leader being a wide receiver again. And I would put rugs on the top of the list to be that guy because, you know, okay, we've had Waller lead the way with 117 targets last year. In 2018, it was Jared Cook. And I think because of these two seasons, we're kind of getting a recency bias that Gruden just wants to enable these tight ends or maybe Derek Carr. But I don't know, guys. You go back and look between 2002 and 2008 when Gruden was in Tampa Bay. Joey Galloway had target seasons of 152 and 143. Keyshawn Johnson went for 142. Keenan McCardell had a 139 target season. Antonio O'Brien, 138. Even Michael Clayton had 122 targets. I mean, that's not even to mention some of the things Gruden did with Tim Brown and Jerry Rice in his first stint with the Raiders. So I think we get back to seeing a wide receiver lead the way in this Raiders offense. And I think that man is Mr. Henry Ruggs. And that takes me to tight ends where – as you could probably guess, I'm not that high on Darren Waller going into this season uh, as a you know premier fancy asset you should be looking for. I see the path of success. It's you know the same thing that's been happening where you know Waller was the PPR tight end three last year and Jared Cook was a tight end five in 2018. And you know they he was successful. He was very efficient with the targets. He's a talented guy and you know amazing success story. You know Darren Waller is the type of guy we should be rooting for. But when we have a roster that has Foster Moreau, who scored five touchdowns and 25 targets in 2019. You know, he's one of those, you know, kind of in that group with Dallas Goddard and Irv Smith as truly talented backup tight ends that could actually force their way on the field more often. And then wh why is Jason Witten in the fold? Because, you know, Cowboys fans know this, where when Jason Witten came back last year in the offseason, it was, oh, yeah, I'm happy to, you know, split snaps with Blake Jarman and do, do a little bit of that. No, this guy was, again, a near every snap player last season. I find it very unlikely that Mr. Jason Witten would agree to go to Las Vegas, join a new squad without some sort of assurance over playing time. So, man, I just don't think the target's going to be there for Waller. He'll still be efficient. He's a great player. But, you know, drafting him – in 2020 to be what he was in 2019, I don't think is a sharp move. Even if you're going to do it 
in uh, best ball where I guess you could, you know, not worry quite as much about the floor and just hope that a player of Waller's caliber could, you know, get the ceiling. I just find myself throughout all these drafts, you know, if I can get Kittle, Kelsey, or Andrews, great. Otherwise, I mean, look at the next tight end, Zach Ertz. Okay, he'll probably lead the Eagles in targets, but, you know, he had 60 targets. Goddard had 55 after their bye week last season. Ingram has the injuries. Higby, scary splits in fantasy football. Gronk, I mean, who knows what Gronk? Is he going to be the best tight end of all time again? Is he going to be a primary blocker as O.J. Howard does his thing? Hunter Henry's got a new QB. You know, Waller just talked about his concerns. I feel like all these guys, tight end, you know, four through nine, ten-ish range, they all carry a bunch of concerns. And, you know, I'd much rather take some late-round dart throws. So, you know, I'd advise anyone out there playing best balls, you know, if you're going to do it, do it with Underdog Fantasy. Use code PFF. You'll get a free entry in their million-dollar tournament. And if you're doing that, you know, either get a top three tight end or throw some late-round darts. I just don't like taking Waller while there's still, you know, stud wide receivers and maybe to a lesser extent RBs on the board. So with that, we'll move on to the ranks. I have Derek Carr as my QB 29, one spot behind Tyrod Taylor, one spot ahead of Dwayne Haskins. And look, okay, if he plays 16 games, he'll finish higher than 29, but we're not getting the ceiling games from Carr. There's never been a rushing floor. I just want to draft Tyrod ahead of Derek Carr because of the first eight games of the Chargers schedule. I think he has a really good chance to provide some uh, um, high-end fantasy production uh, in that range if before if and when Justin Herbert takes over. And look, is Carr going to take another step with efficiency and then maybe flirt with QB1 status? I just don't really see it happening. And again, I, I do think the Mariota concern is real uh, once this season gets in November. Running back, I have Josh Jacobs as the RB13, one spot behind Miles Sanders, one spot ahead of Aaron Jones. If the targets weren't an issue, I mean, you could put Jacobs literally, you know, at six or seven. Unfortunately, that is a reality. And I mean, if, you know, I, I've better adjusted to uh, kind of, you know, considering the targets and receptions in my just kind of fantasy process by uh, thinking about it like this. I mean, think about Josh Jacobs, if he could even have 30 more touches where he's more or less starting 10 yards downfield. That's the advantage you're getting with a full point per reception. And unfortunately, if he's only going to catch 20, 25 passes again, it's just tough to rank him ahead of guys like Sanders, Eckler, you know, even your Mixons and Drakes of the world that are in all likelihood going to flirt with at least 50 receptions next year. So Jacobs, RB 13. Wide receiver, so it, I have Ruggs as the wide receiver 46, and that's not a slight. That's my highest rookie wide receiver one. You know, I did label Ruggs as one of my guys. I have him one spot ahead of Jalen Rager, one spot behind Sterling Shepard. There's just some uncertainty in his passing game, you know, because of that, these guys are depressed. But Ruggs has serious, you know, Hollywood Brown kind of 2019 potential where when he's going to boom, it's going to be a serious league winning week. I am fine chasing that upside 100%. Um, just moved Brian Edwards up a good amount into in the ranking. He's my wide receiver, 63 now. I'm fine taking a dart throw on him. I have him one spot ahead of Antonio Brown, one spot behind Denzel Mims. So I, he is in that territory for me kind of the very end where I do think there's a path where, you know, he could – flirt with, you know, like wide receiver two production if everything goes right. But, you know, if Tyro is going to play, there's a chance that Edwards starts the season outside of three wide receiver sets. And, you know, again, we are taking a little bit of a leap of faith, assuming this offense evolves to get the wide receivers more involved than the tight ends and running backs have been in years past. Uh, I have Darren Waller as my tight end nine, one spot behind Hunter Henry, one spot ahead of Noah Font. I just haven't been coming away with drafts because someone's almost always taken him before me. As I was saying before, go big or go home at the tight end position. Looking at the win totals, uh, we have the Broncos, Chargers, and Raiders all at seven and a half, Chiefs at 11 and a half. I do think the Raiders are the worst team in the AFC West. You know, I, I know they've taken steps to try to improve the defense. Some of those, you know, they've actually drafted um, pretty well in terms of value. Maybe not their, uh, some of their first round picks uh, that have gotten questioned, but you look across the defensive line now and guys like, you know, Maurice Hurst, who they've had some questions uh, going into the draft, but they've seemingly worked out a little bit. So defense could maybe surprise some people, but I just have a hard time, you know, looking at the Raiders, the Lions, some of these teams. I mean, our best case scenario 
scenario. I don't think it's like fielding like a top 12 defense. I think it's being average. And unfortunately for the Raiders, I don't think their offense is in a position to really carry this team, uh, you know, with Derek Carr under center. So I would take the under on seven and a half, and that is being juiced a little bit, minus 125. I just think, honestly, we've seen uh, the best of Carr in this offense. Maybe it proves me wrong, but uh, I will be selling – uh, most Raiders shares this year outside of Jacobs and Henry Ruggs. So thank you all for listening. This has been the PFF Fantasy Football Podcast. I'm Ian Harditz, and until next time, take care, everyone. Thanks for watching the PFF YouTube channel. And if you want to subscribe, all you have to do is push the button. Don't forget everything you get. A little fantasy, push the button. A little green line for the gambling aspects of the game, push the button. College football, push the button. The YouTube channel, from PFF.